Hi guys, so sorry that this is another recorded lecture rather than being an in-person one, but I've been struggling I've been struggling with being out ill for a little while now, so I thought I would just give you this at least and then and that way we're not behind in the course. So I'm going to focus on the two on two of the films for this week so the two short documentaries that i asked you to watch um one of them is Pasolini's la rabia and the other one is uh black panthers by agnes varda they're both quite different films but something that i thought was interesting about them is that they're both made by european filmmakers within five years of each other, who in some way, but in quite a different way, are making a kind of documentary um, which is engaging in a kind of decolonial or an anti-colonial politics. Both Varda and Pasolini were in their own respective countries, in Italy and France, as I'm sure some of you know, were associated with the avant-garde, um, Varda with the new wave, Pasolini with the end of neorealism in Italy. Um, these are both directors who, at least in their, in their most famous early work, did not really have an explicit political content, but who nonetheless were clearly very politically aware of what was happening around them. Varda's uh, famous film Cleo from uh, 3 until 7 or 5 until 7, I can't actually remember, um, uh, features a scene in which the protagonist strikes up a very short affair or very short flirtation and friendship with a soldier who is about to go and serve in Algeria. And Pasolini's Acatone, which was the only feature film that he had made at the point that he made La Rabia, is not a political film in the most obvious sense, but it's a film about the Roman kind of underclass, the Roman, what Pasolini and what Italian Marxists refer to as the subproletariat, the sotto proletariati. Um, so the ones below the working class, the ones without access to employment. So I mentioned this just to give you a bit of context on Varda and Pasolini, but also because I think that their films can be in some ways compared, or they, they both form part of a common tendency amongst European filmmakers to engage in some kind of decolonial cinema or a focus on decolonial action in their cinema, um, even if only momentarily. And yeah, so we'll get straight into La, uh, La Rabia or Rage or La, La Rage as it's, as, it's commented, as it's translated in French. So it's made at a point at which Pasolini is relatively new to directing, but in which he is in Italy very well known as a poet, or relatively well known, well known as a poet. His his book of poems, The Ashes of Gramsci, um, which we'll have a quote from in a minute, has been very successful and is and is pretty well known. Uh, La Rabia is the f first part of a two part film. The second of which was to be made by the right wing director Giovanni Goreschi. Um, Although it's almost, ex I don't, it was never circulated as a two part film. It was never shown as a two part film because Pasolini refused to allow his half to be shown alongside Gereshi's. And it's now, in terms of um, Pasolini's scholarship, it's only ever really viewed as one complete short movie rather than being part of a two part whole. And the second. Pasolini did not work with Girashi on his half of the movie. They were two separate 
enterprises which were originally to be joined together. Um, so it features news footage detailing key historical events set against a voiceover script which is written by Pasolini in the form of kind of a prose poem. Um, yeah, I've said here that it's tended to um, intended to create a kind of historical tapestry, create this sense of a, of a variety of different things happening around the world, including decolonial struggle, um, also including imperialism, including things which would seem to be entirely unrelated, such as the coronation of Queen Elizabeth um, and the career of Marilyn Monroe. And obviously these things are not happening at the same time. They're not historically commensurate, but they form a kind of... Um, um, yeah, kind of a tapestry or kind of a montage of events which Pasolini wants to put into conversation with each other. And obviously something which film can do if we think about cinema as a technique is to, through the very, through its very nature, through the fact that it puts images side by side, um, often images of unrelated things and objects, it can make us draw connections between them. Um, so we'll talk a bit about how this happens in Lyrabia and how it is interesting for a kind of thinking about the history of decolonial cinema or cinema which has been interested in, in decolonization. I'll say at the start that there are um, fairly clear criticisms that one can make of Pasolini's project in Larabia and also in other films in which he tries to engage with decolonization and will make those criticisms as we go through and at the end. For what it's worth, I personally think that the film has value in spite of those criticisms, but I think Pasolini's decolonial politics have value in spite of those criticisms. However, we should acknowledge them and we will acknowledge them. Uh, but we'll give you a bit of background to the film first. So the first thing I want to think about, or I want you guys to think about in terms of the movie is an idea of what we can call universalism. And universalism can be understood in some way or another as referring to a general belief and attitude towards the world which suggests that all people are in some way connected by some kind of shared common trait or some kind of shared historical destiny. Um, some of the first articulations of universalism in the Western and the Occidental world um, come quite famously in St. Paul's epistles or letters in the Bible in which he says, now that Jesus has died and been resurrected, everyone is, um, is the same. Everyone is one in Christ. There's this kind of what can be quite a radical gesture, gesture to say that all differences are now insignificant because there are some things which Either every person or every member of a particular group, which is, I think, more important for Pasolini, um, has in common, regardless of what other differences they may have. It's possible to make universal statements about them, which is why, you know, why we call it universalism. So I'm going to give you a quotation from this poem, The Ashes of Gramsci, which, as I said, was from Pasolini's most famous book of poetry at the point that Larabia was made, which was called The Ashes of Gramsci. This is the book of poetry that really made his name in Italy. Um, and this is a way into talking about... Um, how his universalism works, and then we can see how it worked in Larabia and in the in the context of cinema. So, within the context of this poem, Pasolini is visiting the grave of Antonio Gramsci, who the, who is a at this point very well known, still well known Italian Marxist theorist and kind of a a leftist hero, a communist hero for. Uh, the Italian intelligentsia and also for intellectuals, Marxist and leftist intellectuals around the world. 
and he sees not only Gramsci's grave, but he also sees the grave of British imperialists. And the speaker of the poem, or Pasolini, says, and we'll read this now, here attesting to the still persistent seed of their ancient domination lie these dead men possessed by a greed whose grandeur and abomination run deep down the centuries and at the same time attesting to its end obsessed striking of anvils stifled and heartrending comes muffled from the modest neighborhood so what we have is this situation in the poem this is Pasolini standing in front of Gramsci's grave um uh photo taken after the book of poems the ashes of Gramsci became well known uh, but what we have in this poem is a situation in which Pasolini contemplates imperialism. He contemplates the graves of the British imperialists and he sees that their domination, the colonial system, which they played a role in bringing about and, and enforcing, is still in existence in the world at the time that Pasolini is writing. Um, I mean, that's, in many ways, it's still, or its its legacy is still in existence now, but it was definitely still in existence when Pasolini was writing The Ashes of Gramsci. Um, and what he hears, what the speaker of the poem hears, is the sound of working class work, life and working class labor emerging from a nearby district of Rome near where he's um, visiting the cemetery, near the cemetery that he's visiting, sorry. And what this tells him, it this creates this sense that this world of imperial domination is is passing away, that it's no longer going to exist, for, it's not going to exist for much longer. And the reason that he thinks this is because he hears in the sounds of the working class, he hears a kind of conventional um, Marxist sense that the working class are powerful and strong and they will eventually um, successfully do away with a kind of colonial bourgeoisie, both within Italy and also around the world. And I have a quotation from Cesar Cesarino, who, whose article I've also put up on um on eCampus because I think it's a really good reading or it's a really useful reading of um Pasolini's cinema within the context of decolonization and in terms of what Pasolini was trying to say about decolonization or what it was that um drew him to it. So he says the sound of the hammer marks that force which is labor power and which produces the world of the narrator as a world in which contingent juxtapositions become necessary political relations, as a world in which the sound of the Roman proletariat at work necessarily resonates with the sound of the third world proletariat in revolt. So we have this sense of the, of the third world, of the Tiamond in French, um, which I think this term is is has a history, and at points it's been rejected. At other points, it's been used by the people that it refers to in order to suggest a kind of emphasis on decolonial struggle as being an important, if not the most important, um, example of revolutionary agency. So, for example, one would hear of third world Marxism, which building again on Fanon, who we're going to mention every week because he's one of if not the most important thinker for decolonization, um, argue that actually, whereas traditional Marxism had viewed the European and American working class as being the, the site of any possible revolution, there was as much, if not more, revolutionary potential within the um, decolonizing and decolonized and still colonized populations of um, what were referred to as the third world. So I want to stress that even though that word has a history which 
some people suggest means that we shouldn't use it in the same way that it was used in the 60s and the 70s and the 50s. Um, there's e though it equally has a history um, whereby it's been used by those to whom it refers in order to um, describe themselves and to describe the kind of political positions that they hold. But Cesarino's to go back to Cesarino in the quotation, the point is that he sees Pasolini as having a kind of universalism which connects the Roman proletariat, the sounds that he hears when he's hearing the striking of anvils, stifled and heartrending, with the sounds of the third world proletariat. So with decolonization struggles that were happening at the time that Pasolini was writing this poem and were ongoing and some of them had been successful by the time that he made La Rabia in 1936, 1963, sorry. Um, okay, so we can start to think about the film now and we can start to think about moments in which it is fairly clearly um, making use of a universalism like this in order to um, draw attention to and to comment on the state of the world, both in terms of what's changing in it and what in some way feels eternal or the same. So we start with images of Budapest in 1956 and of the we could call it a crackdown or of the suppression of um, demonstrations in favor of freedom and independence by the Soviet Union, who at this point um, was viewed by a number of Western Marxists, Western Marxists as having become a kind of imperial power. And in the history of um, communist parties, in Europe, something that we often see is 1956 is this date um, when Soviet tanks came into Budapest in order to suppress what was essentially a demonstration which many people around the world supported the right for freedom, the right for democratic rights in Budapest, the right for life outside of kind of um, the Soviet Union as an imperial power, um, was suppressed. And this this moment at which the in which Stalinism revealed or was undeniably a force for the suppression of freedom is something that really sent shockwaves through um, traditional Marxist parties and communist parties in Italy as well as in France and in England. It's a point at which a lot of people left, including Pasolini. Addio, non vi dimenticheremo. Addio. I russi sono troppo vicini. Il 4 novembre un uragano di ferro, di fuoco e di morte si abbatte su un popolo che chiede libertà e rispetto della persona umana. So we start with these images of Hungary. Ungheria è scoppiata la controrivoluzione. Nere città d'Ungheria, i fratelli bianchi uccidono. Neri ricordi d'Ungheria. I fratelli borghesi non perdonano. Nera pace d'Ungheria. Chiedono sangue per le colpe di Stalin. Il ministro della difesa austriaco si intrattiene con i doganieri che sono passati dalla parte anti -russa. Can move forward a little bit. And then, so we have these descriptions of Hungary, including scenes of protest in France, and then again we see a kind of historical universalism in which... Uh -huh. 
ha assalito la sede centrale del Partito Comunista francese e l'ha dato alle fiamme. Queste nevi erano dell'altro anno, o di mille anni fa, prima del nostro Sono madri nostre, figli, nipoti, vecchi parenti nostri, queste figure identiche sopravvissute dai giorni del pianto. So at this point, it feels Pasolini kind of creates this tapestry whereby he's suggesting that all um, experience is kind of historically universal. He's suggesting this kind of experience of defeat, which in the same way that snow covers over all the differences of whatever it is that it's touching, it makes everything white. He's kind of suggesting that this sense of defeat and despair that is being felt by people in Budapest and people in other parts of the Soviet Union is universal, has been felt by people um, generations previously, for example. And again, we have a, a a kind of universalism which is, in this stage of the film, um, evidently negative. And again, something that I want to draw attention to when I say here that the technique of film combines with a specific view of history is that you, the way that film works, the way that montage and editing works is that it brings together things which are not necessarily related but it puts them in se it puts them in a kind of sequence which means that they whether or not they have anything to do with each other they necessarily take on a kind of connection they necessarily show themselves to have a kind of relationship just by virtue of the way in which they appear on the film uh sorry finger slipped um and it's at that point once he's kind of established this universal narrative that we see decolonization entering the film Stati di Allah, pattuglie egiziane sparano. Oh, here we have struggle in Egypt in 1956. Miserabili uomini di colore sparano. Funebre sole di Allah, in nome di mille popoli sotto proletari. So we'll talk about this throughout but if we see he just says in the name of a thousand subproletarian people and the subproletariat um as i mentioned before in relation to akatone it's a class which is viewed to be below the proletariat it's the class of people who do not have regular work people who may live in slum conditions people who are not industrial workers in the way that we would think of them in the 19th and early 20th or early to mid 20th centuries um and when pasolini says that the struggle was involving a thousand subproletarians in egypt again egypt at this stage is not an industrialized country so there is no real proletariat for there to be a subproletariat, what there is are uh, large numbers of dispossessed people who are struggling for a kind of freedom. So again, we see Pasolini's universalism here in the sense that he extends the idea of the subproletariat, which refers to a very specific kind of class identity within capitalism, to, as I say here, to situations. Um, which refer to non-industrial countries, to situations which refer to decolonization kinds of struggles or to struggles against um, colonization rather than the more conventional Marxist reading, which would just say, look, you have the proletariat and the subproletariat in industrial countries and decolonial struggle from 
what we might call peasants or people who live on the land or who have a different kind of relationship to work um, is something else. So whether we agree with this or not is an open question, but Pasolini's gesture in relation to decolonization is to make everyone around the world who is not either a colonizer or possessed of property uh, a kind of sub-proletarian. So we can see this in the passage on Egypt and we also see it in relation to the Congo in which Pasolini I'll show you the footage in a minute, but he shows footage, news footage of Patrice Lamumba, who was the elected leader of the Congo, who was deposed in a CIA coup and was later executed. Um, and we see him here. And again, what we have in the film is this sense that these events, while they may be quite disparate, while they may not actually have a relation to each other, Egypt and the Congo are very far apart. Um, they're both decolonial moments and Pasolini is using his cinema right, right, rightly or wrongly um, to maintain a kind of universal connection between them and at this point we also move on to decolonial struggle as a kind of source of energy <laughs> Dobbiamo annettere l'idea di migliaia di figli neri o marroni, di infanti con l'occhio nero e la nuca ricciuta. Altre voci, altri sguardi, altre danze. Tutto dovrà diventare familiare e ingrandire la terra. Dobbiamo accettare distese infinite di vite reali che vogliono, con innocente ferocia, entrare nella nostra realtà. Sono i giorni della gioia, i giorni della vittoria. Gente di colore, la Tunisia viva la liberazione. So again, we have countries in North Africa, we have countries in Central Africa, um, not always named we have this sense that decolonization is bringing something to the world which it had previously not possessed and this sense that now new countries, new people through decolonial struggle are entering in some way into history, like they're taking on a new kind of form. Um, and again, and a form which is penetrating the European reality, which Pasolini very much represents and is interested in. And again, I want to draw attention to, I'll do it now as we're talking about it, or as I'm talking about it. Um, this is a very, what we would call Eurocentric perspective, even still. Pasolini's solidarity is very much with decolonial struggle at this point and as I say I do think that his cinema from this period is worthwhile and is worth thinking about but it's undeniably Eurocentric so it's undeniably it repeats a series of assumptions about the the countries that it's describing by suggesting that they that their history only really begins at the point at which they decolonize and again it says like it's assuming that they become globally important at the point at which they decolonize, as if that history hadn't existed previously, as if there were not contradictions and and difficulties and all kinds of things that could be said about these countries prior to the moment of decolonization. 
So I think in some ways his cinema is, Pasolini's cinema is very much focusing in a positive way on the kind of newness and the um, the energy and the sense of renewal and potential which the world in some way felt within what we can broadly call kind of a decolonial moment. So within um, situations in which struggle in Algeria, in the Congo, in Cuba, um, some of which was, you know, deeply successful for, in certain pretty tangible ways, um, especially for those on the political left, brought a kind of sense of renewal. Um, sorry. And we see this in the kind of um, the way that Pasolini wants to kind of center it and frame it as much as possible. Si preparano anni di miseria, di lavoro, di errore. Gente di colore e nella speranza che l'uomo non ha colore. It's a classic universal statement and hope man has no color. Gioia dopo gioia, vittoria dopo vittoria. Gente di colore, tanganica e libero, una povera libertà di cui l'Europa può sorridere. Gente di colore, un'altra nazione dell'Africa è indipendente. Una libertà elementare con tutta la strada ancora da percorrere. L'unico colore è il colore dell'uomo nella gioia di affrontare la propria oscurità. Cuba è libera. And again, it's, it's, I think it's clear to a modern audience the way in which Pasolini is, repeat, is repeating kind of patronizing assumptions um, about the places that he's talking about, but at the same time he is declaring a kind of solidarity with these places, and we can see this kind of contradiction um, throughout his throughout his work. And for some people, it's unforgivable, and for other commentators, it's um, a kind of political gesture which, while it is certainly open to criticism, is still worthwhile, um, especially for the time that it was produced. Um, I have another quote here which I think is interesting in terms of the way in which some of these images are working, um, is that in Pasolini's cinema the body stands firm against the reach of capitalism and more generally of the Western logocentric tradition as a vector of historical truth that exceeds verbal and rational discourse. So to put this simply, what I think this means is that in Pasolini's cinema, this person, Fabio Vigi, is arguing that the way that he uses physical bodies, the way that these bodies appear before us, and I think La Rabia is an example of this, um, in some ways it contains a kind of level of pure reality, of a realness and a tangibility which is... Um, not beyond history, but which in some way is um, forces us to pay attention to its material quality. To the now, there's a kind of nowness of a of a human body which is never recuperated into um, whatever kind of historical narrative it's a part of, and which is always in excess of whatever kind of historical narrative it's a part of. And we see this throughout this film. We see both, we see a kind of narrative which Pasolini is developing about decolonization and the way that it's affecting the way in which he is viewing the world. Um, but we also see the physical images of the bodies themselves, of the people who are living and moving and laughing and smiling. And this brings with it, um, I think, what Pasolini thinks of as a kind of immediate reality to his um, to his worldview and to the to the view that the the people whose images he's employing in his cinema 
what they carry with them, the effect that they have. So we'll watch the cube a bit and then we'll move on. Again, classic universal statement. In victory, the only color is the color of mankind. And again, we can see the Cuban Revolution. We can see the way in which it appealed to uh, to a Western Marxist audience as an example of successful decolonization um, carried out along Marxist lines with a kind of Marxist-Leninist emphasis. And this isn't a politics course, so we don't have the time to go into the details of the Cuban Revolution or its drawbacks either. Um, but what we can say is that we can use Pasolini as an example of an intellectual and a filmmaker who is very attracted to what he saw and what many people around the world at the time saw as the kind of real radical political potential of the Cuban Revolution as an example of successful decolonization. La vittoria costerà sudore. I nemici sono fra gli stessi fratelli. La vittoria costerà terrore. I fratelli attaccati al terrore antico. La vittoria And again notice the way in which we see these people who are recognized, we know they're Cuban because we know that this is the kind of caption that he's provided earlier, but their physicality, their physiognomy, we could say, the way in which he's f using the, f they're not photographs, but the kind of photographic qualities of the images that he's using, all of this also just makes us see them not simply as Cubans, but as First of all, as people, there's the sense that, and I think for Pasolini, this is a very important part of what he thinks only cinema can do, is present us with a kind of immediate reality to their lives in some in some form. Um, obviously, we don't see the complexities of it, but we see something tangible for Pasolini, and that's very important. Nella loro ferocia una gente. Combattere a fine. Forse solo una canzone poté dire cos'era il combattere a Cuba. Combattere a Cuba. Forse solo un ballo. Pote dire cos'era il combattere a Cuba. Combattere a Cuba. So he's showing images of guerrilla warfare in Cuba. Um and he soundtracked them with a kind of happy music and he's giving a kind of poetic description of what he perceives, I think, as being the, perhaps not the joy, but certainly the kind of purity of um, that decolonial struggle. And again, evidently, it's, it's possible to make criticisms of this as being patronizing or as um, misunderstanding the difficulty and, as we can say, romanticizing um, warfare, essentially. I mean, Pasolini never took part in guerrilla war. He was never a fighter. His brother was killed by, um, by communists, actually, by communist partisans at the end of World War II because um, his brother was fighting for Mussolini. Um, but it's still, again, it's not something that um, Pasolini had any direct experience of, and it's very easy for us now to view this film as being, um, as covering over the reality that it's it's claiming to represent. So we can we can bear that in mind throughout. But again, we get this sense of always newness for Pasolini. Always decolonization brings about this sense of the new, unexplored seas. Um, a kind of new vista for humanity. 
um, both for the people who are struggling in a decolonial situation and also for everyone else um, who is affected by and who shares a world with the people who are involved in this kind of decolonial struggle. As Castro, obviously, morire a Cuba. Forse solo una canzone poté dire cos'era il morire a Cuba. Morire a Cuba. Era come morire a Napoli. So dying in Cuba is like dying in uh, Napoli or Sevilla. Again, we have a kind of universalism which is being employed by Pasolini and it's also a universalism which is based around a sense of the subproletariat. It's based around a sense of the dispossessed. Naples is famously one of the most um, unequal cities, one of the most um, one of the cities in which there is the biggest juxtaposition of poverty and wealth in Italy. And it's also a city, and Pasolini was very interested in this too, it's a city with its own very strong, still very strong dialect, um, a kind of ways of life which have endured um, for a very, very long time and which continue to, and languages which continue to, and Pasolini has a kind of fascination with um, what he perceives to be the worlds of people who in some way or another are excluded from conventional life and he draws these kind of parallels between Cuba and between Naples I think because he sees the struggle of what he thinks of as a subproletariat in Cuba as being correlate or equivalent in some way to the lives of the subproletariat in Naples or in Sevilla um, in southern Spain and again, we can see this perhaps as a powerful political gesture of solidarity, or we can see it as um, a covering over of difference in some way. But whatever it is, it's a response to um, decolonization. Um, there's a lot in this film which we're not going to talk about um, because... Well, it's just not, and it's, you can you can watch it yourself, and you should get the gist of what I'm saying. Um, the last thing that we can watch, though, is just this um, meditation on visual art. Notice all the different classes, all the different groups of people. Again, the Pasolini is drawing them together, but he's also... There's something about the fact of film which draws all of these disparate, disparate things into sequence. Again, I keep saying this just by necessity of them being on the film together. So we'll finish just by looking at his at the correlation that he posits between class struggle and art. <laughs> So starting from the beginning, when certainty doesn't exist, um, becomes a kind of aesthetic demand. It becomes something for artists to do, and it's previously something that we've seen. This idea of starting again is previously something that we've seen being expressed in decolonial situations. The idea that you start again and then you 
or the idea that you engage in decolonial struggle and this opens up a kind of new historical horizon for you, this is something that we've seen in conversations about uh, the Congo and Cuba pre earlier in the film, and now in some way we're suggesting a kind of correlation between that and an art and aesthetic expression, but he's going to complicate that a little bit. So again, he draws the correlation between Algerian partisans and working class people in other parts of the world. Um, and people in factories where the struggle of the classes is fought. So again, we have a kind of correlation between um, decolonial struggle and conventional, what we might call Marxist class struggle. We also have a correlation of both of those things with a kind of energy of aesthetic expression. And we also see, while on the screen, we see that in we see the visual images, we see the paintings and the in the voiceover in the in the poem that Pasolini is reading, we get more of a sense that the class struggle is what's really important and it's this which gives a kind of energy to art rather than the other way around. <laughs> So in the factories of the of of Europe and in the desert of the colonies where the fight for freedom is fought. Chi direbbe che il sentimento così profondo della libertà abbia vita in cuori che hanno vite così umili? Umili come Again A lot of the discourse of this film is using terms like humble, using terms like innocent, which I think they, they speak to something about the kind of newness of struggle which Pasolini is very invested in, but at the same time they are undeniably um, playing up to a kind of... Um, historical trope with quite a long history about the way in which Europe and the Occidental world as traditionally the, the non-Occidental world as somehow being more innocent, uh, less rational, more humble. And these are big problems with Pasolini's decolonial politics. At the same time, I'll leave it up to you guys to make up your mind in terms of whether you think there's also something useful or moving or beautiful in this film, the way it's phrased, or also the way in which kind of universalism um, works as a kind of gesture of positive solidarity with, um, with decolonial struggle, um, either historically or even, even now. And I think that's a good point to, I think I've covered everything I wanted to say. I'm just going to check I haven't missed anything. No. Okay, that's a good point to move on to the Vada. Um, actually, I'll just see what it... I'll just change my PowerPoints around. Okay, so... If we move on to Agnes Vada's... Agnes... Yeah, Agnes Vada's 1968 short documentary about the Black Panthers... And what I'll do is I'll give you a bit of history on the Panthers and then we'll look at some bits of the documentary and you'll see the ways in which um, Vada's project, there are some, uh, some correlations between the kind of things that we've been talking about, but also some pretty significant differences too. And we can see how the two of these, um, these two figures compare. Um, so, the first thing I want to think about, um, actually, we will, I'll explain that picture in a bit. 
So the Black Panther Party originated in Oakland in Northern California. Um, and they were originated, uh, first of all, by this guy, who is Huey P. Newton, and by Bobby Seale. And they were originally termed the Black Panther, the Black Panther Party, um, for self-defense. And uh, as you see being explained in the documentary, um, it was actually Huey Newton who was studying law in San Francisco. Oakland is right next to San Fran, right next to San Francisco. It's across the bay from San Francisco. Um, discovered that it was not illegal in San Francisco, in Northern California, or in California in general, to carry an unconcealed weapon. As long as you had a weapon which was visible to public view, it was acceptable for you to, to carry it. Um, and at that point, as Varda's documentary explains, um, Newton and other members of the party, who at this point was, which was small at this point, even though it later rose to become, J. Edgar Hoover described it as the single biggest, biggest threat to national security in, in America. Um, and we'll talk more about the Panthers throughout the course as well. We'll be watching one of the latest films that was made about them. Um, in the earliest stages, they were operating police patrols, which were essentially, they would follow police officers um, with visible weapons, with shotguns usually, um, which they wouldn't plan on using, but they would follow them in order to ensure that proper practice was being carried out, that people, that black people were not being harassed unnecessarily, which they were and obviously still are very frequently in the US and elsewhere. But the essential idea was that through having the kind of visible capacity for self-defense, um, they would be able to, the Panthers would be able to exert a kind of agency and a kind of action that they would not be able to without that. Um, and Chewy Newton in 1967 and 1968 wrote a series of essays which describe the... Um, the political philosophy and the actions being carried out by the Black Panther Party, and which describe them in, as we'll see, in explicitly kind of decolonial terms or within, as if they were existing within a kind of situation of colonization. And I've already gestured a number of times that we're going to be dealing with ideas of internal colonization. Um, on the course. And this is where they really come up for the first time in the discourse of the Black Panther Party. Um, something which is worth noting as well is that the um, we've seen Birth of a Nation on the course. The Oakland Police Department and several major police departments in California were intentionally recruited um, in the, at the end of the 19th century and in the early 20th century. Um, from the KKK, from the Ku Klux Klan. So there is a direct line from the activities of the Ku Klux Klan in the southern states of America to the, the formation of um, police departments in major American states, including California. Um, not exclusively, but if you read into the history, there's a significant trajectory. And Oakland and California are actually one of the places which has um, had a significant recruitment um, from either families of KKK members or straight up KKK members. So that's worth bearing in mind. There is a through line from what we were talking about in terms of Birth of a Nation and the ideology that we see in Birth of a Nation um, to the reality that the Black Panthers uh, at the time that Varda was filming them and subsequently were um, struggling with and conceptualizing and thinking about. 
Um, but we'll read this quote from Newton's essay, The Functional Definition of Politics. Um, so Newton says the only way he, meaning an African-American person, um, he or she can become political is to represent what is commonly called a military power, which the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense calls self-defense power. Black people can develop self-defense power by arming themselves from house to house, block to block, community to community throughout the nation. Then we will choose a political representative and he will state to the power structure the desires of the black masses. If the desires are not met, the power structure will receive a political consequence. We will make it economically non-profitable for the power structure to go on with its oppressive ways. We will then negotiate as equals. There will be a balance between the people who are economically powerful and the people who are potentially economically destructive. So we have... This is quite early on in the in the trajectory of the Black Panther Party. We at this point we immediately have this kind of sense of the importance of self defense and also the sense that in some way or another political power is something which you have to struggle for and which you have to be capable of defending yourself physically through arms in order to be able to use or to get at all. And then we have this, the kind of correlation between the situation of African American communities in Oakland and in other areas of the US and colonized people who, as we've just seen in Pasolini, people who are engaging in decolonial struggle and the Panthers started to frame their, their actions as, as a kind of decolonial struggle. So we have, because black people desire to determine their own destiny, they are constantly inflicted with brutality from the, out, from the occupying army embodied in the police department. So we have the description of the police department as an occupying army. Newton is reading Fanon at this point and has been reading Fanon for a while and the Black Panthers will continue to use the Wretched of the Earth as one of their key theoretical texts. There is a great similarity between the occupying army in Southeast Asia and the occupation of our communities by the racist police. The armies are there not to protect the people of South Vietnam, but to brutalize and oppress them for the interests of the selfish imperial power. So again, we have a kind of universalism here. We have a kind of correlation being drawn between the um, between one group of people who would not necessarily be thought of as being colonized because black people in America are citizens. They are not... Um, excluded from the nation politically, even though in lots of ways economically, evidently racism did lead and does lead to all kinds of exclusion in the US. It was not uh, a technical constitutional one uh, in, the situa in the way in which a colonized country um, does not allow the people it's colonizing to be full citizens of it we can nonetheless draw a kind of political universalism, a kind of sense that this is a powerful gesture to equate one's own situation to the situation of colonized people and people engaging in decolonial struggle. And if we just start watching a bit of the documentary now, we see the ways in which um, Varda is framing the Panthers, the way in which she suggests their agency and also their appearance, uh, she depicts their appearance in Oakland. So we'll watch a bit of it. Assuming it's working. Hang on. Sorry, my uh, internet is shit. This is the movie version, which I think I suggested to you guys as being 
one with better sound quality than the one that I gave you. Um, I hope this works in a minute. If not, we'll get it off my... Okay, let's see. Okay, so you get the idea. That's Stokely Carmichael, who was a um, famous, influential civil rights activist, um, later involved with the Black Panthers, arguing that the situation, again, which um, the majority of black people face in the US is equivalent to or can in some way be thought alongside the situation that um, people in South Vietnam and people in North Korea, in Korea faced as a result of US military intervention. Um, and I think, again, this is a kind of universalism, and it's not a million miles away from what Pasolini is saying, but notice how different the the framing is. We don't have any of this sense of humility or of what Pasolini thinks of as innocence, we get much more of a sense of of agency from this group. Vada is much more invested seemingly in, perhaps because she has access to sound and she's making a documentary about a very specific group of people, um, we get much more of a sense of the voices of the people who are speaking. So there's some important things in that, aside from the universalism which we've spoken about, is also Carmichael and, in general, this kind of emphasis on language and on being able to, to name things in a way which allowed them to make sense, in a way which enables you to act in a particular way. And this, again, was a big part of redefining the situation that the Black Panther Party saw themselves in as being one of colonization then produced a series of theoretical consequences which enable you to take certain kinds of action um, 
And in Huey Newton's autobiography, he talks at length about the importance of naming. And we'll just give a quote from from Huey Newton's autobiography in which he says, um, he's talking about Nietzsche, actually, if anyone's interested. And he says, so the ruling class, by the power they possess, define themselves as godlike and call the people villains or enemies of the ruling circle. Needless to say, when the poor and common people internalized these ideas, they felt inferior, guilty, and ashamed, while the nobles took their superiority for granted. Thought had been shaped by language. And then he goes on to discuss how slogans, how renaming things, how reconceptualizing things linguistically gave a... Um, impetus and a potential to the kinds of actions that the that the Panthers wanted to carry out. So another expression that helped raise black people's consciousness is all power to the people. When we created it, I had in mind some distinct philosophical goals for the community that many people did not understand. The police and the press wanted everyone to believe we were nothing more than a bunch of young toughs strutting around with guns in order to shock people. But Bobby and I always had a clear understanding of what we wanted to do. We wanted to give the community a wide variety of needed programs, and so we began in a way that would gain community support. At the same time, we saw the necessity of going beyond these first steps and developing our newspaper. We were working toward our long-range goals of organizing the community around programs that the people would come to believe in strongly. We hope these programs would come to mean so much that the people would take up guns for defense against any maneuvers by the oppressor. So this is another way of thinking about the idea of the Black Panther Party seeing themselves as a kind of very visible um, vanguard. So someone that would, an uh, organization that would in some way lead and develop a kind of revolutionary consciousness in parts of the US and in parts of the African American population of the US. And again, this will be based around um, understanding life as if it was a kind of a kind of colonized life, a kind of a life that had in some ways more in common with those who were engaged in decolonial struggle as it did with your average white middle class person. Um, so we can see some clips in relation to this idea of visibility we see the absolute visibility of the Panthers throughout the film. We see how distinctive they are. We see the way in which Varda frames the crowd. True nation, this decadent American society. Education, education that teaches us our true history. And, our and again, we see this sense that the thinking in terms of decolonization, thinking in terms of a kind of agency which understands um, one's own situation to be one which is similar to being colonized also involves kind of uh, involves a new education, involves a new vision of history, involves perhaps a kind of universalism that we were talking about, but not one that would cover over the specific experiences of um, Black Americans who. Um, for whom the purpose of this education will be to realize their true history and then to be able to act and to understand their situation. Our role in the present day society. Doing what are we doing daily? daily? Like I said before, we are organizing the community, going into different people's homes, you know, edu politically educating them, telling them uh, exactly what... Notice something aside from the... aside from what this person is saying, notice the way that Varda's camera frames... Um, the crowd it's very much on a level you don't get a sense of the camera looking up or looking down you get it's just intended to give a kind of frame and a vehicle for the voice of the person who's speaking and there's no there's very little voiceover there's very little there's a kind of a, an establishing voiceover but there's very little sense that um 
Vader is trying to assign a kind of meaning to the things that she's showing outside of the meaning that they themselves obviously carry or outside of the meaning that the people who are directly engaging in them um, give to them, which again, we can see a significant difference, I think, between Pasolini's vision of what decolonization means and what it means for a Western intellectual like Pasolini to create this kind of historical universalist tapestry in which workers in Italy are equivalent and engaged in the same historical struggle as militants in Cuba and what it means for the Black Panther Party who are themselves engaged in direct political action in their own communities, actions aimed at both education but also at things like community food programs and one of the first things they did was a free breakfast for school kids program in Oakland. We can see I think a significant difference between Pasolini's relationship to this history and um, Varda's relationship to it and we can see in that two different styles of what we can broadly call documentary filmmaking, I guess, and how that might relate to different aspects of decolonial, of the history of decolonization. What is going on, not only here in Oakland, but in America and throughout the world. See, many black people are not aware of what is going on in America, or what is going on in South Africa, or over there in France, for instance, you know. We organize, uh, since the black community is not a reading community, we uh, talk to them, show them examples. In our paper, we have pictures, you know, so they can uh, see what is going on. And then after they learn what is going on in the black community, then they can step forth and try to change themselves. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Number six, we want all black men to be exempt from military service. I'm a draft constant. We started the Black Draft Constant Union because we realized the problem that black people are not aware of their rights under the draft law. Uh, we feel uh, that uh, black people should be exempt from the army because, like, they have nothing to fight for in Vietnam. Nothing whatsoever. They go back, they go to Vietnam, they fight, they come back, and things are the same. They haven't gained anything. Number seven, we want an immediate. And again, we have. The time the film is being made, we have the context of the Vietnam War. Um, part of the um, the decolonial ideology of the Black Panthers also at one point involved. In fact, I'm just going to show this to you now. There's an image by Emery Douglas, who is a who was uh, the visual artist who created the majority of the images for the Black Panther Party's magazine. Um, I hope this comes up fairly quickly. Um, there's an image which articulates a kind of continuity and solidarity between um, what the Panthers viewed as colonial warfare in Vietnam and their own situation. So I'll pull this up for you. Sorry, my, my internet is very slow. Um. So if we just see this, it says it's all the same. And then we have local police, National Guard, and Marines. So it's kind of three levels of military, essentially. Um, and we have the Marines who would be fighting at this point in Vietnam um, and elsewhere. Uh, we have the National Guard, who are essentially the domestic military. Um, and we have the local police. And again, we have a kind of universalism which is being employed in this. We have a kind of, not only do you have solidarity, not only the Panthers claim solidarity with groups um, engaging in decolonial struggle, but they also, it works in the other direction too. So 
um, what they understand as colonial or imperial action by the US um, is connected to police brutality, which they themselves suffer. And it is the Black Panther Party were, and again, we'll We'll talk about this more later when we watch Judas and the Black Messiah. Um, but the Black the Black Panther Party were subject to the most sustained and um, technologically sophisticated um, crackdown of any group in American history up until that point, which included um, military grade weapons alongside intense surveillance and. Um, and other strategies used to disrupt their activities. So this kind of universalism is not just a political gesture. It also had it also had a kind of real historical um, basis too, and it worked itself out as as the Black Panther Party were became more and more the target of suppression. The images like this actually were more and more obviously um, made more and more sense to um, to those who were distributing them as it became clear that the that the that the Black Panther Party was being subject to a kind of military suppression more or less um, and the last thing I want to do the last scene I want to watch um, I would obviously encourage you guys to watch the whole film it's not very long um, and there's a lot that I haven't talked about. I haven't talked about the way that the uh, Vada presents gender. I haven't talked about the way in which um, Eldridge Cleaver is presented, which is who is someone who about whom you can do your own research, but he is not someone who you want to um, who certainly his behavior in lots of ways was very unadmirable. Um, and the documentary doesn't, because of its focus and because of the way in which it, um, that's him, that's Eldridge Cleaver, fuck him. Um, it doesn't go into any background detail. Um, But something which I do think is interesting is the f uh, is the final couple of minutes in which we see this guy and Varda in kind of using using his cinematic technique flips the focus slightly and suddenly we've we've been seeing the Panthers in the park we've been seeing significant the sense that the group is small but they've very much captured our attention. And now we get a sense. So that's Oakland in the background. Um, and this guy doesn't know what's going on. Um, and the tone of the documentary just kind of changes um, towards the end. And I'll just play these clips and then we'll finish. A uh, boy named Huey is being tried for shooting a police officer. Do I find you know more about it than that? Uh, not really, except that there seems to be quite a bit of furor in the colored community about the trial, and they keep demonstrating in front of the in front of the courthouse that they they want us to. Uh... Really, they want to free Huey. So again, we get this sense. Suddenly, I think within this, um, within this very small scene, like what Vada does is she creates um, a dissonance between the power and the agency, which we see in the Black Panther Party. In the same time, the way in which they appear to the to the outside world. Um, so I'm just going to end with this quote from, um, again, from Fanon, 
um, who we haven't read for a while, or we haven't read this week, but in his essay, Algeria Unveiled, which I would thoroughly recommend to anyone who's interested in reading about the um, the history of struggle in Algeria, um, he ends by saying the colonialists are incapable of grasping the motivations of the colonized, and I feel as if something that Varda is gesturing towards in her in the way in which she shoots this final scene is the kind of confusion of the um, of the middle class guy who's speaking at the end um, versus the kind of assertiveness and the certainty of the of the people who are marching, who include and again we can talk about this later include um, people who aren't who aren't black and again the Black Panther Party were known for um, reaching out and creating um, and seeking out solidarity with um, other groups of people, um, other groups of um, other leftist organizers, other leftist um, organizations who were not necessarily um, defined um, solely by their race. So there was a big emphasis on solidarity. There was a big emphasis on crossing race lines um, provided that there was a shared interest in um, a struggle against what was perceived as for the Panthers as um, colonial oppression. And again, we can talk about that when we watch Judas and the Black Messiah, which is about Fred Hampton, um, someone who was considered by by uh, the American government to be extremely dangerous as a result of his capacity to generate these kinds of uh, cross-cultural solidarities and activities. Um, and yeah, I just, there's an interesting cinematic trick that Varda pulls off in the very closing seconds of the, of the documentary when she moves you slightly outside of the, outside of the park in which the film had previously taken place and shows you how this how these scenes appear to to someone who is not invested in them um, and again we can think about that as first of all something that Pasolini never does when he's filming La Rabia but also something that he would have been unable to do and something that locates the kind of very intense intellectual and physical actions which are going on in the documentary in in Varda's documentary within what turns out to be actually potentially but not necessarily quite a small world it suddenly becomes just a park in Oakland again um so yeah I think that that's uh that's a point to finish on hopefully I'll be well enough to be able to actually come in in person next week, but I'll, I'll let you know. I'll try and give you more notice this time. Um, and yeah, guys, so I hope you're enjoying the course. I hope you're keeping up with it okay. If you have any questions about anything, um, either any of the material that we've covered or anything that I... And a thing about how the course is working or what you will need to do at the end of the course, then you can write to me. And yeah, I hope you're all good and speak soon. Bye.